Pythagorean theorem. And we've talked about that. Uh, but when Pythagoras proved it, uh, I don't know if there was a particular usefulness of it, proving it in general, uh, but later on, you know, the, the relationship of the sides of a right triangle gets used everywhere. It gets used in, in theoretical work, it gets used in, you know, construction, all, all throughout science. It's probably the thing that arises the most, the Pythagorean theorem. And all through uh, math history, one of the things that happens is the mathematicians see themselves as poets and artists, and they're just discovering things because they're having fun. They, they enjoy this pursuit of looking for relationships, looking for patterns. One of the famous stories that makes the uh, example clear is, uh, if I, I, uh, I get the name straight, oh, uh, the, I can't believe the uh, German mathematician's name's escaping me. Um, it'll, it'll come to me later, but, but uh, this, uh, extremely famous German mathematician was coming up with all these theoretical results about uh, different space. Uh, everyone had always talked about Euclidean space and that's what most people think of, three dimensions, you know, cubes and cylinders. And he came up with this theoretical result, you know, like, you know, different, different geometries of space. He did it because it was beautiful and abstract. Fifty years later, to, to simplify the story, uh, Einstein comes along and he's the physicist and he's trying to explain uh, the anomalies of the universe and he's getting bogged down in the mathematics and uh, uh, Riemann, Riemann's the uh, German mathematician. Someone directed him to Riemann's work and the other mathematicians who built on it and that's the mathematics he needed to uh, prove and, and put the theory of relativity on a foundation. So that's like one of the classic examples. People do the theoretical math because they think it's interesting and beautiful. Later on, other people find uses for it, and it happens all the time. What's ever not being used now, well, we're, we're in the moment. In the future, someone's going to find a use for it. It's virtually guaranteed. One of the big things in history of math that I'm realizing is previously there were certain narratives being given and everyone followed the, uh, the theoretical math. Uh, the Italian algebraists figuring out solutions to the third degree equation and the fourth degree, and then when you couldn't do it for the fifth, uh, you know, what all that led to. Uh, historians now are really looking at, well, what did these applied mathematicians do? The people who were just teaching arithmetic to the businessmen. And uh, Luca Pacioli, who's in uh, Crosby's book, uh, he came up with the uh, uh, accounting method, what's it called, you know, dual, dual entry accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's practical arithmetic, and, and I can tell just by reading older history of math books and more recent history of math books that that was given, that, the practical math sometimes was sort of like a second class citizen. It wasn't interesting because the math wasn't as involved. It's a lot of arithmetic and some basic mathematics, but now that's what historians are interested in because it was overlooked. I think it's analogous to uh, more general historians were always interested in the big political events and what the emperor did. And, and as far as I can tell now, there's a movement among historians to see what the common man did. You know, where did he get his food? Where did he get his clothes? And you know, so I think uh, there's uh, there's more and more books coming out about the practical math and these schools for teaching the businessmen. Uh, it was really a small segment of society. If, if you read history of math, you know, you, you hear about Archimedes. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll hear about uh, Kepler and Galileo and these huge epochal figures that, you know, made big changes. Uh, now they're looking at, you know, what did uh, the people who were more commonplace do? The, the, the math professors who were training students and business people. So I don't know if that answered your question, but 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 you did tap into uh, yeah. something that's getting a lot of attention nowadays. Interesting. Yeah. Please. Just from what you talked about, it sounds like you know, the Renaissance really went through like um, internal Asia and then the Mediterranean coast. But what was happening in like the Northern Europe and all that time? Well, there was a Northern European Renaissance for sure. It it took longer because the travel. They didn't have the tunnels through the Alps, yeah. okay? They, they were built in the late 19th century. Um, 
But yes, many of the ideas moved into so-called Western and, and, and Northern Europe. Uh, Erasmus is, is one a philosopher who comes to mind. However, if, if I can generalize, they're, they're, at least in the art of the 16th century, right, the late, late 15th century, early 16th century, among Flemish artists and Dutch artists, who was much more of, of a focus on religious subjects. That was a continuity from medieval Western European culture. Then, then you found there's much more. I mean, the portraits. That, one thing I didn't show here was was the the explosion of portraits in Renaissance Italy of the so-called common men. I mean, but these people weren't common. They were merchants who had enough money to hire a painter. But at least they were having their portrait painted, and they were not cardinals or they were somebody was merchant. And it certainly was a northern European renaissance. Are you saying though that kind of came about a little later because of the, like, the mountains, for instance? That's one of the reasons, but uh, the, the center of the economic engine of Europe moved during the renaissance from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, to the Netherlands, to the UK, and remained there, one could argue, until World War I, where it became an engine of economic engine of the world, using the oceans. I mean, the, the Medici used the Mediterranean. The British used the whole, all the oceans in the world. Okay? So a big part of the, of the Renaissance was that shift following Columbus, and Columbus was motivated by the Ottomans, he was motivated by the demise of the Mongol railroad system, and opened up the oceans. I mean, the Chinese could have done it, but they decided not to. And Columbus opened up, if you want to understand, the, the real contrast between Medieval world history and early modern world history is the importance of the oceans for trade and for military and naval superiority. And that, and, and that was not in the Mediterranean. That was with, with the British base, the Dutch and the British. And that, uh, and that evolved out of the, the people just understanding how to navigate and how to use um, boats better at that time? Yes. I mean, why was there an explosion at that time as opposed to... Because of, um, uh, well, many reasons. One was the, uh, was the composite discovery, the composite construction of the ship that Columbus and da Gama used. It had Roman sails. It had, it had Italian cannons. It had a Chinese compass. It had a Chinese rudder that worked in the oceans. And it had, a, it had a sail in the back that could turn and catch the wind, called the Latin sail, really misnamed, I think. And that made, that made navigation on the oceans possible because to go from, to go from uh, London to get out into the Atlantic currents, to go to Barbados, let's say, the winds were constant once you hit that Atlantic current. But to go from London to the current a couple of hundred miles, the winds changed all the time. So you had to have a sail, unlike the Roman sails that never, they were just rectangular, you couldn't move, right? The Latin sail could change the direction of the ship and it could tack. And it could eventually, if someone knew what he was doing, he could get you out to the, to the highways of trade that were the ocean currents. And the Latin sail was Islamic. Yeah. In order, came from the Nile, right? Uh, and then was introduced to uh, to uh, Western Europeans in the Mediterranean. But well, that's one of the one of the reasons. 